Hello, my name is Katia and I'm part of the Next Train team. Today I'll be doing a demonstration to show you how to explore SARS-CoV-2 builds for trees in Auspice. And Auspice is the visualization software behind Next Train. In this demo, I'll be using a Washington State focused SARS-CoV-2 tree, um, but I'm hoping that the info that I share will be applicable for you in exploring your own SARS-CoV-2 builds or really any other um, next strain pathogen build. So when you use next strain to build a phylogenetic tree, um, the main kind of output file is going to be a, a JSON tree file. And you can take this JSON file and then look at it in Auspice using a couple of different methods. So this first method would be to actually install the Auspice software locally on your computer. Um, and so this is our docs page. Uh, with instructions on how to do so, and also instructions on how to update it. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, you should take a look at these docs. If you don't want to install something, you can also just drag and drop that tree file onto Auspicious. And um, Auspicious is great because your data will never actually leave your computer. It always stays on the client side of the browser. Um, so it can be a really great way to look at private or sensitive metadata. Um, without any security concerns. Um, but of course, if you're using Auspicious, it requires you to have that tree file locally on your machine. And if you're working with other team members or collaborators, you don't wanna be sharing some big um, you know, output file back and forth. We've actually developed another way called NextString Community to uh, solve this problem. And with NextString Community, um, it allows you to view any um, any NextStrain JSON that's on a publicly hosted GitHub repository on NextStrain's website. Um, so here I am in this public GitHub repository. It's in the organization Bedford Lab, um, which is where I work. And the name of the repository is encode-washington-build. And in this repo, I have a folder called Auspice. And so when there's a folder called Auspice, NextStrain will know to, to look in that folder. And so, um, if we look in this folder, we also see that there's this main tree file here, and then there's a couple of accessory files. And I have named this file in a pretty specific way. It starts with the name of the repository, encode-washington build. Then I have an underscore, and that's 4M. Um, and also I would note that I'm here on the branch called demo. So I'm not actually on the main repository, kind of the master, the main branch of this repo, I'm on the demo branch. So when we've named um, a file in this way, we can then open up a new browser tab and go to nextstrain.org slash community. And then you go to the organization that the GitHub repository is in, which in this case is B-Lab. Then I'll go to the name of the GitHub repository and go desk washington mesh build. And I go at the branch that I'm on. If you're on the main branch, you don't need to do that. Um, and then I put the 4M which is whatever is after that um, underscore. And now this will actually take that file from GitHub and view it on NextStrain's website. Yeah, woohoo, so here's our tree. Um, as you can see, this tree has just over 2,800 samples were collected between December 2019 and June of 2021. Um, and the first panel is the phylogenetic tree. And in this panel, each of these circles or tips uh, represents a, a virus sample that was collected from someone and then sequenced. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have time. And on the y-axis, you know, we have the branches that are showing the evolutionary relationships between each of these samples. And you can hover over um, one of these tips and it'll bring up more information about the sample. Uh, you can also hover over the branches that are leading to tips and it'll tell you the mutations that go along that branch, as well as the number of descendants and the inferred date. The next panel in next train or in auspice is the map panel. And on this map, um, we have circles showing where each of the samples in the tree um, came from. And the size of the circle here represents the amount of the number of samples in the tree. So because this is a Washington state focused tree, um, we have a really big circle over Washington State. The next panel is the entropy panel, and it shows the calculated Shannon entropy 
for each position in the genome, either at an amino acid level or a nucleotide level. Um, so you can see that here in the spike gene, there seems to be an excessive amount of um, entropy as compared to the rest of the genome. And that's consistent with the antigenic evolution that we're seeing in spike. And then our final panel is the frequencies panel. And the frequencies panel um, just shows the kind of calculated frequency of whatever you're calling the tree by. So in this case, clade on a weekly basis. So here's it is at December 13th, and then the next week and the next week and so on. Um, and so this panel is really useful for looking at time trends um, that we see within the tree. We can control which of these panels are displayed using the toolbox on the side. So if we go all the way down to the bottom, I'm gonna turn off the entry panel because we won't be using that for the rest of the demo. And then I'm gonna change the view to grid view. And now if we scroll back up, we can see that this has now placed the tree and the map right next to each other. Um, so that'll just be easier for the rest of the demo. In this toolbar, um, you can also see that there's a number of tree options. Um, so I can display the phylogenetic tree um, in various ways. Um, I, right now I'm showing a rectangular phylogenetic tree, but I could also show a radial tree or an unrooted tree. And then we also have clock view and scatter plot view, which I'll go over. I'll go over scatter plot a bit later in the demo, but I want to show you clock view because when I build a tree, um, this is something that I'll actually go to right away because it can be really helpful for quality controlling your sequences. So in clock view, we show um, time on the x axis, mutations or divergence on the y axis. So this allows us to estimate a substitution rate for the virus. Um, pretty readily. And it also helps us to see um, kind of samples that might be signs of sequencing error. So for example, we have this cluster of samples here that might look like they have a, more mutations um, than would be expected from that time point. And so that to me is a good signal um, that this might be sequencing error. And I would know to you know, exclude these samples in the future from any future analyses. So that's clock view. We'll go back to your rectangular view. And so I said that this was a, this is a Washington state focus tree and it was built to really explore and keep track of what's going on with, you know, SARS-CoV-2 in, in the state of Washington. Um, so when we constructed the tree, we put a lot of thought into deciding um, what kind of non-Washington sequences we wanted to include it, so we could appropriately construct um, introductions into the state. But when I'm exploring it, um, a lot of those sequences are, are not what I want to look at. So the first thing I'll do is I will filter out um, sequences that are not from Washington. To do that, I can just type in Washington here in this um, text entry box and hit that, select, select state Washington. And this has now filtered my tree and my map um, to only show samples from Washington state. So we have just over 1900 samples um, in this. And additionally, the frequency panel is now updated as well. In addition to filtering, I can also change what I color the tree by. So right now we are coloring by next string clade, um, which I'm familiar with as a next string team member, but not everyone is. Uh, so, you know, you can color by other things as well. You could color by um, geographic variables like location, state, country, region. Um, you can color by pango lineage, which of course is that classification that, you know, many people are quite aware of. Um, it's not one that I will often use the next strain because obviously there's so many pango lineages that it can be a, a bit difficult to keep track of. Um, so instead, I like to use a coloring called emerging lineage. And with emerging lineage, um, essentially any sequences that are in a variant of concern or variant of interest are shown in color and non-variant of concern or variant of interest, interest sequences are shown in gray. Um, and so, you know, you can see we have alpha variant up here or B117, um, and then there's P1 or gamma variant there, delta variant is here. Um, and so if we look at the frequency panel in Washington state, we see that, um, you know, around November, December is when 
kind of variant viruses really started to, to increase in the state. Um, and Epsilon was, uh, to, was the kind of dominant variant for a while. Um, then it was taken, overtaken by Alpha variant. And then um, P1 variant also increased in frequency and has kind of maintained steady state. And currently the a variant that's growing in Washington state is um, Delta variant which is consistent to dynamics that we're seeing uh, you know, in other locations in the United States and around the world. And so in this tree, um, I might want to learn more about what's going on with Delta in Washington. And I can look at this again using the filter option. I can just type in Delta here and that will pop up the clade. And if I hit that, um, now our, our filtering will um, update to combine and only show sequence that are, sequences that are in Washington state and also in um, the Delta clade. And now if I hit zoom to selected, you can now zoom into that portion of the tree. And um, just something to note, I use the text-based uh, option, the text entry box for filtering here, but I could also have scrolled down to the bottom and I could have um, hit 21A Delta to filter by clicking on it. I could have filtered by state by clicking on Washington. Um, so these options are also available. I just prefer to use the, the text-based box because I find that a little bit simpler. All right, so, so when I'm exploring kind of an outbreak or a specific variant in the state, I will often switch the tree to be a divergence tree. Um, currently it's a time tree. So it, on the x-axis is time. But if I hit divergence, um, this will now shift to just show mutations on the x-axis, which is you know, a more appropriate way of looking at um, you know, a smaller portion of this tree. And because we have this Washington filter on, um, you know, the, the sequences that are highlighted here, are, you know, shown in the thicker lines, are all sequences um, that were collected from Washington state. And then these thin lines were sequences collected from other uh, places around the world and around the United States. And so you can immediately see that there's been a number of introductions of Delta into Washington state. And many of these introductions really haven't taken off. There's not a lot of evidence that they need to cause onward transmission. Um, whereas some of these introductions really have taken off and, and caused continued transmission here in Washington. And so one question that we might have is where do these introductions come from? Were they primarily introductions from um, you know, other locations in the United States? or were they introductions um, from other countries? And I can begin to get at this question by using the geographic coloring on the tree. So if I scroll up here and color by, and I select state, and this is um, kind of a custom coloring that I have chosen for many, many builds, it's division. And this will show um, any states within the United States in color, um, and then uh, it will color samples from other locations in gray. And so first off, we still are only seeing these red samples because we have this Washington filter on. And I can now turn off that filter temporarily, just temporarily inactivate it by clicking the eye. If I wanted to delete it, I would hit the trash can, but the eye will just tempor temporarily inactivate it. And so now we can see that um, we have our Washington samples here in red. And then there's one other there's one other sample from the United States um, that is closely related on this tree, it's a Massachusetts sample. But most of the other um, samples in the tree are collected from other locations around the world. And so that immediately says that most of the introductions into Washington are um, international introductions as opposed to domestic introductions. And we might wonder um, from where in the world are these um, samples coming from? And so to answer that question, I'm gonna now change my coloring to region. And just sorry, my internet's being a little bit slow. There we go, dated. And so because we just looked at the tree, you know that no, most of these North America sequences are from Washington. Um, and then if we look at, you know, what samples are kind of most close, what, most closely related to these Washington or North America sequences, um, we see that there's, you know, a lot of Asian samples that are closely related, um, and African samples that are closely related, 
in Ocean yeah, samples from Australia and New Zealand, they're close related, um, but not very many from Europe. And so that is consistent with most of our introductions for, of Delta into Washington um, coming from this part of the globe, you know, which are having kind of massive epidemics of Delta right now, um, and just places that unfortunately do not have um, access to vaccines and so having big epidemics um, and much many fewer introductions from Europe, which is also of course consistent with Delta having emerged um, in Asia. So um, if we wanted to explore how this outbreak was, uh, you know, what was going on more with this in Washington state, say we had additional metadata from certain pop populations where we knew there'd been an outbreak of Delta, um, maybe in a school or in a nursing home or something like that, um, we could actually explore that by dragging and dropping more metadata onto the tree. So to, to demo that, I have this um, dummy metadata file in Excel here. And in this dummy file, um, the very first column is strain, and it contains um, you know, a list of strains that are in the phylogenetic tree. And then I have these variables, different variables. So I have a grouping, um, which is just group A and B and C and D right now is the next column. And I also have um, some dummy latitude and longitudes. And so um, when you have a CSV or a TSV file that is set up in this way, in which strain is the very first column, and you have these other additional columns. You can actually just take this file and go back to the tree. There you go, just a second. I can just take this file and drag and drop it onto the tree. And now when I've done that, you can see that there's, it's ignoring a lot of these samples, which don't happen to be in this phylogenetic tree, but it's added metadata for a few more nodes. And so now if I scroll down to color by, um, I now have some additional colorings that were not available. So the first is the name of the file that we used. Um, and in this case, it'll show in yellow, anything that was in the, the file and in gray, um, everything else will be in gray. And then I also have that other column, the group column. And so now it's showing um, those groupings um, on this tree. So it looks like, at least for this data, there's been a number of, uh, a lot of these outbreaks that have been a little bit larger seem to have been in group D, and there's been more one-off outbreaks in the other groups. Um, and it doesn't look like there's a lot of mix between the groups. It looks like you know infections that were in group D seem to have mostly stayed in group D, and there wasn't mixing into other groups in Washington. Remember how we had latitude and longitude in that file? Um, so you can also scroll down here on the map options in the toolbar and actually change the geographic resolution. Um, and I'm going to change that to the name of the file. And when I do that, it changes um, where in the map we are. So if we scroll out, you'll see that suddenly it places these samples in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that's because that's where the dummy latitude and longitude um, that I used are. Um, so you can, if you include latitude and longitude in a file, it will, um, you can update the map with those specific lats and longs. And so, you know, you can imagine using this to look at schools throughout a region or wherever. While I'm here, if I wanted to explore maybe a specific clade in more detail, perhaps this one here, I can just click on a branch in the auspice tree. And when I do that, um, it'll actually automatically just zoom into that portion of the tree. And then when you zoom in, you can see that now these tip labels are being displayed. And we can control um, what tip labels are shown. Any of the metadata can be shown on a tip label. So you know, right now we're showing sample name, but I could also show clade, which isn't that interesting right now because it's all 21A delta. You could show sample date, um, you know, state, which is all Washington except for this Massachusetts one that seems to be uh, potentially descended from a Washington outbreak. And so that's another way in which you can show kind of an, another level of, of metadata or information on the tree. 
In addition, we can change our branch labeling, which was clade, to amino acids. And now it will actually show any of the amino acid mutations that have occurred um, on those branches. So you can see that there, um, you know, we have this G142D here in spike up on this branch, um, and there's more around. You want to go back to the view in the tree, you just click that root node a couple of times, and it'll just take you back to whatever view of the tree you're on. Yep, so now we're back to I'm looking at 21A delta. And I will change this back to clade labels. All right, so um, another option that's available is something called download metadata. So if I, if I have this tree here um, and I wanted to maybe just download just the segment of the tree, I don't wanna look up the entire tree and the associated metadata. Uh, if you scroll to the bottom, um, you hit download data and this will allow you to download both a Newick tree or a Nexus tree and the associated metadata um, for each of the tips that are currently being displayed. So right now we were showing 88 of the 2,800 tips in the tree. It'll only download the tree and metadata for those tips. Um, and so this is a way in which NextStrain is actually portable with other, um, other software pieces. Uh, so like our public health partners have used this to download a tree um, and then put it into you know, a different tool like Microbe Trace. And then if you wanna go away, you just click anywhere else on the screen. And something that I forgot to mention, um, but is quite important is that any additional metadata that you have drag and dropped in, onto the tree, again, will only stay on your side of the browser. It never leaves your computer and gets sent up to some server. Um, so this is also a good and very secure way to look at sensitive metadata um, that you don't wanna be sharing with someone else, um, whether it's PHI protected or whatever, um, just dragging and dropping it on will keep that data secure. All right, so that's kind of an example of how you might use NextStrain to explore an outbreak or explore the dynamics of what's going on with a specific variant in a location. But you can also use NextStrain to um, kind of be looking for novel things that are occurring on in the phylogenetic tree. And so to do that, I'm going to um, eliminate this 21A Delta filter. So we're gonna quit looking at Delta and I can do that by clicking the trash can. I'm gonna turn our Washington filter back on. So I wanna focus on Washington dynamics. And then I'm gonna reset the layout. And this will take us back to showing the full tree because we only had coloring on um, for this metadata. It, you know, it's only showing that part in color. So we'll change coloring back maybe to clean. And I'm gonna switch back to a time tree because um, in a divergence tree, you can see that when you look at a big tree, all of these tips overlap and it's hard to see what's going on. So um, in addition to, to coloring by clade or, or geo or all these other metadata variables, you can also color by genotype. Um, and so in this case, you choose um, you know, one of the genes, we'll choose spike, and I can color by any amino acid position in spike. Um, so I type in 484 which of course is a position, um, you know, which mutations are found to be, you know, kind of associated with reduced antibody neutralization. Um, you can now see um, all the, the samples that have like a K there or a Q there. Um, and so, you know, we see kind of clades that we know popping up like gamma clade, um, et cetera. It can be sometimes a little bit like hard to see everything because, uh, you know, samples get hidden behind whatever wild type is. Um, so I can also filter the tree by genotype. So I typed in 484K. This would allow me to filter that. And so in that case, you know, we're only looking at samples that are 484K and, and it's easier to get a better picture of them. Um, you can also combine which uh, amino acids you color by. So I can also color by 501, for example. And now, um, you know, coloring is updated by, by both of these options. So, um, you know, you can see 
what has a lysine and a, a tyrosine, you know, right at those positions. Okay, so the, the final option that I wanted to show um, was the scatter plot view. And this is one of our newer options, additions into next strain. And essentially it allows you to view the data in the tree on any custom X and Y axis, axes. And you can choose or choose not to show the branches between all the samples. So I'm gonna turn off the branches and I'm gonna look at S1 mutations because we have this hypothesis that increased um, like S1 is a place where we're seeing anagenic evolution going on. And then I'm going to look at logistic growth or logistic growth coefficient right here on the y-axis. When we do that, it looks like there appears to be a relationship between the number of S1 mutations that a sample has and its logistic growth, um, which is interesting. So we might wonder, okay, like which of these samples are growing well in Washington state? And so to change that, I'll put on the y-axis, I might put uh, emerging lineage, which is a categorical variable. And I'll put on the x-axis, I'll put logistic growth now on the x-axis. And now you see that for each categorical variable, it will kind of display a distribution plot um, for that, that categorical variable. And we can clearly see that in Washington right now, Delta variant is um, growing uh, the most the most rapidly or you know, the, the fastest rate. And so um, you know, that's consistent with other things that we're seeing you know, in other places in the world and in the United States as well. So that's what I have to share on how to use OSPITS. Um, there's a lot more information and things that you can do with it. Um, if you wanna learn more, there's our docs page. Uh, we also have a discussion group, um, which is a great place for people to post questions because we can answer them there, but it's also other members in the community can see them and answer them um, and just learn from them too. So thank you so much for your time and for watching. Um, and please do not hesitate to reach out to us if you have any questions.